Coming up on this week's show, we talk with the voice of the Whiteboarding Griffin series, Julian G. Simmons. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 237 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Will from willcanals.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Jeff Adams. Hey there, everybody. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. A big thank you to Jody for recently joining us. We'll have more information on how you can join the community at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we got coming up for you next week. Welcome back, everyone. Another week, another show. We hope that if you've been spending a little bit of extra time at home, you've had the opportunity to read some good books. Absolutely. I had the chance to talk about some good books this week. I got to do an article on the Frolic website. Of course, we're part of the Frolic Podcast Network. And I got to go talk about some hockey books. Of course, the Stanley Cup playoffs should be happening right now, and they're not. So I took a moment to highlight some of my all-time favorite MM hockey romances and also talked a little bit about the Hockey Allies Bachelor Bid romances as well. If you want to see what I recommended, you can go over to frolic.media and they'll have it there. And of course, I will have a link to that in the show notes. And if you're looking for even more book recommendations, Jeff and I recently released the Patreon bonus episode for the month of April. And in that, we covered some of the best sellers in the gay fiction category, some really terrific ones. You added so much to my TBR as you went through those books in that episode. We also covered the classic movie Big Eden that's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. If you're interested in gaining access to that special bonus episode, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast, and we have all the information on how you can join us there. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Hi, I'm Jay from the LGBTQ romance review blog, Joyfully Jay. At Joyfully J, we review tons of LGBTQ romance, as well as romantic fiction and nonfiction. We review ebooks, audiobooks, and even the occasional movie. We typically review about 18 books a week, so Joyfully J is a great place to hear about new releases, catch up on books you may have missed, and find some new favorites. In addition to our reviews, each weekday we host an author as our first post of the day. This gives readers a chance to learn more about new releases get exclusive excerpts, find out about the author, and participate in great giveaways. Each author post on Joyfully J is exclusive, so you get access to book and author information you can't find other places. At Joyfully J, we love LGBTQ romance and are excited to share it with you. Stop by the blog at joyfullyj.com. You can also visit us on our Facebook group, The Joyful Jays. We'd love to have you join us. You may or may not have noticed that I haven't been talking about books recently here on the show. With the global pandemic and social distancing, my head just hasn't been in that particular game. For some reason, I wasn't feeling fiction. But I finally am back in the mood, and one of the books that got me back to my happy place was Temporary Husband by Dev Bentham. This is a fake relationship story. It ticks off all of the boxes for me, and it reminded me why I love fiction so very much. It's the story of Matt, and he's up for a big promotion at his job. The only problem is is that in order to quote-unquote fit in at this conservative firm, he's had to create a fake husband, a guy named Ben. And the reason he's done this is because He's still a very young guy, and he wants to give the impression that he is, you know, stable and hardworking. And what better way to do that than to come up with a fake husband? The only problem is, is that this promotion is going to hinge on introducing said husband to the rest of the office at a corporate retreat. So he needs to find himself a husband, but quick. That husband is going to end up being male model Tony. And he's been in the modeling game for quite a while now, and he's thinking about the next steps that he wants to take in his life. Primarily, he's studying to become an EMT. So he agrees to this tropical vacation and pretend to be a fake husband, because during his downtime, he'll be able to study for his exam. 
But of course, with all fake relationship stories, things do not go according to plan. When Matt and Tony arrive in paradise, they realize this isn't a corporate retreat, as it's just Tony, Matt, his boss, and his wife, and the other guy who is up for the promotion. So the next few days are essentially going to be a one-on-one test to see who's going to get the job. Forcing Matt to play nice and play golf, which he doesn't know how to do, and forcing Tony to spend time with the gals and go shopping with the wives and have spa days, neither which our two heroes enjoy particularly much. It's during these trials and tribulations that they, of course, get to know one another and realize that their fake relationship may not be so fake after all. Tony wants to know if this promotion is actually worth it, because the people that they're spending time with are genuinely awful. (laughs) Matt assures him that it is, but he's like, really? Are you sure? (laughs) Fortunately, Tony's cover is eventually blown, but he saves the day using his EMT training when the boss has an unexpected health emergency. But even then, it's obvious to Tony that All of the pain and suffering that they've been going through isn't worth the eventual prize, which splits our happy couple up, but eventually Matt comes to his senses and realizes Tony is the one worth fighting for. I love this book so much. I mean, I've talked about fake relationship stories over and over again, and these kinds of stories are my happy place. And I think what Dev Bentham does in this particular story is she hits the proverbial trope on the head and gets everything right. Uh, Plus, she's come up with really two genuinely likable and kind heroes and Matt and Tony, which you also know is something I love. Nice guys falling in love. It just makes me so very, very happy. So I really, really recommend Temporary Husband by Dev Bentham. Nice. I mean, she even titled the book for you. So you, it would just stand out. So you'd find it. I knew right away. (laughs) It's like, yep, that's the one I want. That's the one I need to read right now. And it's a gorgeous cover too. I have to say, I've liked it since the first time I saw it. And welcome back to fiction, by the way. It's good to have you here. Oh, thank you. (laughs) So the book I'm going to talk about, you're going to be like, Jeff, why are you reading that book in these times? (laughs) Because this will not be for everybody, but I have to say that I loved this book so, so much, Global Pandemic or not, because it gave me kind of all the satisfaction that the original Hunger Games did back in the day. I got very into the world of The Fever King by Victoria Lee. This book is urban fantasy with dystopian themes, political intrigue, thriller elements, and magic. One of the things that sucked me in right away was that Gnome, the 16-year-old lead character, is a technopath, meaning he can control technology. This book takes place in the former United States, about 100 years in the future. Gnome is a bisexual Jewish Latino son of undocumented immigrants, and he spent much of his teen years fighting for the rights of refugees that are routinely deported. Everyone is on edge because of the outbreaks of viral magic that occur in this war-ravaged country. The virus is dangerous, but if it doesn't kill you, you gain magical powers. The government takes particular interest in Gnome because he survived a magical outbreak and because of his connections to the refugee cause. Nob ends up under the tutelage of Lehrer, who is the Minister of Defense and previously king of this new country. While Nob bunks with some of the other magical teens, he gets private lessons with Lehrer, who also is working with his adopted son, Dara. Now, Victoria packs a lot into the Fever King, which makes it a page turner. Nob desperately wants to put his new magic to good use. Once he gets the hang of how to use it, and and, and that ain't easy either. There are some wildly kind of funny misdirections of the magic occasionally. But when he finally gets it, Victoria gives us such amazing descriptions of how it feels to him to use his magic. And it made my tech geek self oh so very happy. It's also during some of these learning sessions that Gnome and Dara's very slow burn romance begins. To call them enemies at the outset might be an exaggeration, but it's certainly clear that Dara certainly wants nothing to do with Gnome, despite the definite attraction that is flowing between them. Their journey is intense and not only full of teen angst, but also influenced heavily by political and adult-caused issues as well. The guys do find time to explore their feelings, though, and in the midst of all the chaos around them, this provides a very sweet core and a welcome pause to some of the action. 
And what action there is for Gnome. Is Lair actually letting him make progress on refugee issues? Are the people that Gnome trusted for his entire life actually who he should be trusting? My head spun as Gnome got exposed to new information on who to trust or not trust or what he should be doing, who was actually on the side of right. Victoria weaves the suspense and political intrigue expertly, and it's difficult to describe without getting into spoilers, but I got to where I questioned everything as my own paranoia increased about who to trust among the characters who were influencing Gnome. In some ways, Gnome has to wonder if he can even trust himself. Much like the world we actually live in, information can be manipulated, and sometimes it's hard to tell what is actually motivating people. All of that paranoia created a perfect thriller. Gnome gets involved in a couple of times in pulling off amazingly complicated missions, either ones that he's doing of his own accord to try to get information or being sent on them by Lair. Gnome is smart, but he's also young and inexperienced with his magic, and man, does that create some tension-filled moments as he's trying to infiltrate government facilities or trying to get at some intel that might actually be able to help his refugee friends. The finale of The Fever King is epic and heartbreaking at the same time and raises a lot of questions. One part of the story arc finishes for Gnome, but there are many things he still needs to discover. And that slow burn with Dara gets extended too. Luckily, book two in the Fever Wake series came out in March with the electric air. Rest assured that that is very high on my to-read list because I need to know where this story goes next. As I said, I am as hooked on Victoria's story as I was on the original Hunger Games. Kudos also to Michael Crouch. I love what Michael does with narration, and he doesn't disappoint here between his great characterization of Gnome, shifting between brave and broken, as well as the politically driven Lair, and everything he does with the, with the romance between Gnome and Dara is just perfection, and it all so much enhanced Victoria's story. So if you're up for some urban fantasy and dystopian intrigue, do give The Fever King by Victoria Lee a try. If you're interested in learning more about the books or anything else that we've talked about on this week's show, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for episode 237 at TheBigGayFictionPodcast.com. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at Facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast and see what we get up to next. So this week I got to sit down with the voice of the Wyborn and Griffin series, Julian G. Simmons. It was incredible talking to him to find out how he got involved in this series, what he thought of this 12-book series that encompassed such a wide-ranging universe that Jordan L. Hawk created. And we also got into some of his background, too, how he got into performing, and also talked about his life as a writer and television producer as well. Julian, welcome to the podcast. It is incredible to have you here. Thank you, Jeff. I'm really, really happy to be here with you. So, of course, so many people are going to know you as the voice of Wyborn and Griffin across 12 stories from Jordan L. Hawk. Why born? <laughs> like that one. <laughs> That's actually one of people's favorite characters is Christine. Even though some people say, well, she's too nasally this time. So I'm like, I, I try and be aware of those things. Time passes. People yeah. might get more nasally over time, right? I, right? Well, I definitely can. I'm from <laughs> Buffalo originally. So we're very nasal there. Tell us the origin story. How did you get involved with Jordan to become the voice of this series? Well, the way it happened was I am a member of the Screen Actors Guild, and they were having this kind of workshop seminar about narrating audiobooks when it was still fairly new. And I went to this thing. I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting because I've always like played with voices and things. I, I love doing that. And there was a guy named Scott Breck who was, you know, one of the biggest audiobook narrators there is in the business. He, he's done literally thousands of books. And there were people from Audible there running this workshop. And they said at one point, can we have some volunteers come up and you can try and see what you think and we'll we'll critique you. So I, of course I <laughs> raised my hand and I went up there and and I did it and they said, you know, that was pretty good. And I realized that I really, really liked it. I 
then went on the Audible site, and there, there's a place where you can join as a narrator, and then you just start looking for projects, and you audition for projects. You send in, a, you know, a, like a three-minute audition piece that the that the author or the publisher puts up that you can then audition to. And I came across Jordan's first book of Wittershins of the series. And one of the things I really, really liked about the book when I was reading about it was that it was about a couple that was, well, they weren't quite a couple yet. You know, they were, they were about to meet, but it was, there was a real romance there. And I tend to be more romantic than I am just anything else that way. And I've been in a relationship for a long time and the characters kind of reminded me of us. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try for this. And it was an interesting deal because, you know, it was kind of an experiment for Jordan looking to see like if people could really bring this book to life because there were so many different, really, the, the characters were, there was like this variety of characters. And I thought, well, I can do that because <laughs> I just love, you know, creating characters. And I sent in the the audition. The, there wasn't like pay up front. It was like, do this basically gratis. And then you split whatever the income is that comes in from the book. And I thought, well, you know, I'll do that. And so we did the first book and. You know, I don't think I did that great of a job with it. I was actually shocked when he hired me and said, you know, yeah, let's do this. But, you know, there are steps like you have to once you agree to do it, then you have to do like the first 15 minutes of the book and the author has to approve that or the publisher, whoever you're working with. And so there are steps along the way so that they make sure that they're happy with what you're doing. But it was also this kind of deal where I had to actually record it as well. And I am like, you know, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to technology, I just can't I can't do I, I mean, I can function. I can do the computer and everything and set this up. But beyond that, I, I just don't I, I wouldn't know how to start recording and editing mm -hmm. an audiobook. I'm much better at the creative, you know, <laughs> so, so I enlisted a friend of mine who was like, had won an Emmy in sound design for Cosmos. And he said, oh, I'll help you with it. But then he got busy. So then I brought in, asked my partner if he would help because he's also from entertainment business. He's a director and a writer producer. So I brought him in and it, it was really trial and error, you know, that kind of thing. And I wasn't really completely sure of myself, which is, you know, when I first heard it, I thought, yeah, you know, <laughs> this is not really great, but it's not going to get any better. So and then people who, you know, listeners who who heard the book, you know, a lot of people didn't really didn't like it. And I understood. But also, like when I listened to it the first time, I realized that there was also a lot of that character there in what I had done, that uncertainty, because he was, you know, Wyborn was so uncertain about everything in his life. And he felt so out of place and such an oddball and all those things that it actually worked for the character. Mm -hmm. And the more people listened to the work, you know, beyond the first book and that the more they people would say to me, nobody else could do these characters, but you, you are these characters. And that, you know, that you can't give me a better compliment than that. Right. It's really quite wonderful. So I, I guess that, you know, there was enough success from the first book that, you know, Jordan was happy that we went on to do the rest and, 11 actually 12 books later yeah Yay. 11 novels and a short story <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and i really miss them already because i know them so well it's like they're real to me mm -hmm. you know they're real people that you know i don't sit around in my living room and talk to but <laughs> you know that they, they they are just as real to me as as anybody i know mm -hmm. they are so fleshed out because the writing was so good 
from the element of that you've performed them now for so long, how how do you feel like their trajectory is gone as as a storyteller across twelve books? You know, as the books went on, they became more about the action, you know, than about the intimate relationship because it's it's almost I, I mean the sexual relationship. Yeah. The intimate relationship obviously is there throughout the whole thing in the way they communicate and interact. But as far as the sexual, it became less and less about that, mm -hmm. which is good, I guess. I, I'm a fan of Harper Fox. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm forgetting the name of it now. The one about the detective and the boyfriend who is, uh, or now husband, who is a psychic. Mm -hmm. And I, I've listened to about five of them. I'm more of an audiobook person now because I do them. And I have I love the characters. I think they're really, really interesting. But, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm curious to see, I know I'm talking here a lot, but, you know, I, I, when I look at the, the gay community, I see so much of our identity disappearing, it, you know, becoming more, homogenized into society, you know, even like neighborhoods and things like something that specific down to just little, little more subtle things. And that kind of troubles me a little bit because I don't want young gay people to forget where we come from, mm -hmm. you know, that we, there was a struggle and there's still a struggle ahead of us, but there was a struggle to get where we are. And and in that sense, it's wonderful to to read Wyborn and Griffin because they they've dealt with some of those struggles for sure, but there there's also this kind of fantasy quality to the books that allows them you know in a Victorian era to be and do the things they want. I mean, there's the the books are about outcasts, you know, mm -hmm. one way or another, the oddballs and the nerds, the whatever you want to call them, which is what makes it so wonderful because they all find each other. I, I, I mentioned to you before we started that I host a podcast that's called Talking About Our Generation, which is about baby boomers. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because there's something that I talked about there and people said, well, you know, what 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 was it about Woodstock? Well, you know, when we, we did a thing on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, and I actually tried to get there with a friend. We were very young in a car and we were like eight hours away, couldn't get there. There were so many cars on the road, but it was <laughs> this kind of compelling feeling that you needed to be with people who were like you, you know, mm -hmm. who were not of the norm, if you will, and not that Woodstock was a big gay gathering, but it was for people who just felt different about the world. I grew up in a really industrial city where that was like not okay. So you were constantly searching for like-minded people. Yeah, it's why I think even even now all the strides that we've made, why why Pride Month is still so important to to have the parades and to have the gathering and to have the that larger sense of community. Yeah, what, you know, however that is represented, you know, and there's a lot of things now that, you know, there's some, some parts of our community that are very ultra, you know, who just like they want, they, they there's one element of the community who doesn't want that element of the community to be kind of part of it anymore because it's it's tarnishing their new view of what they want to look like as gay people. But all of that, whether you're part of that community is the community, you mm -hmm. know, of people who struggled to get where they they are now, you know, to give all these freedoms that people have and to be able to have audiobooks that deal with, you know, LGBT love relationships or yeah. sex or whatever it is or coming out, you know. And who would have thought that would have even been here like 15 years ago? Exactly. You know? Right. And I and like how Jordan captures it in these books, because I mean, even in this most recent book, there are scenes where Wyborn and Griffin either pull back from each other or quickly change their behavior because they're about to maybe be seen in a more intimate moment. Because they are, despite it being kind of urban fantasy, alternate reality, 
they still live in a Victorian era where, you know, their behavior and their relationship would not be taken well. Exactly. Like when they're walking out on the street and I think it was the one scene where they're in Boston, I think, and they wanted to reach out to each other mm -hmm. more when they're driving on the wagon to, to get to Widdershins through Boston and, and they can't show how they feel towards each other. And, you know, people don't really know what that's like unless they've gone through it, right. you know, that you can't show that. Of course, you know, back in that era, two people just didn't show it, period. Right. You know? Exactly. <laughs> you know, nobody showed it. You know, it just was not acceptable. What was your impression of the world they inhabit when you first encountered it, like when you were deciding to go and, and submit the audition? I loved it. You know, the environment that Jordan creates, you know, it's always rich. Mm -hmm. it, it's rich and full. So which is what makes a good writer, you know. I'm still learning that in my writing, you know, the importance of creating that environment that your characters are living in, because it's not just about what they think and do, you know, it's how all those things around them influence them. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you get the sense, like when you go into the Ladysmith, you know, the museum, you, you, you totally get a sense of, you can smell that it's old. You can, you can hear the echo in the hallways. You can, feel the old wood that's holding the that's making up the exhibit cases and all that i mean it's just it's full of the things that are stored that are weird and bizarre that no other museum has you know right it, it's kind of cool across the 12 books what would you say some of your most challenging moments have been to portray in there oh my god uh well sometimes george will just like pack in like 15 characters into a scene you know? <laughs> and they all have different voices. And I'm like, Oh my God, how am I going to do this? I would have to switch between voices and, and that's like a whole different person. It's almost like you have to be partially schizophrenic or something <laughs> and, you know, hear voices so that you can get 15 different characters in. I, I think most of the time I did a good job with that. There were times when it was uh, excruciating to try and switch between the characters. And sometimes I would forget, you know, it's like, who, who no, wait a minute, who is this? You know, and, and then I would have to go back and, and do it, which is great about recording that you get to go back and fix stuff if it needs to. And, you know, sometimes you don't get the voices quite right and you, when you listen to it, you go, oh, I don't really like that. So we need to go back and do that. And it can be, like I said, sometimes it can be a grueling process because one of the things that make Jordan's book so great is all, are all these characters. But it, it's also a huge challenge to try and, well, not only do, do the voices, but figure out, well, what are these voices going to be, you know, and how do you make them sound at least a little bit different enough so that people recognize that somebody else is talking mm -hmm. because it's not always clear who, we, who, you know, if you just do this kind of monotone read through, you're not giving them a world, you know, mm -hmm. of, of people, which is what is the, the, it enriches the whole process so that when they put down the listening, you know, take the earbuds off or whatever, and you want them to go, wow, that was like, I felt like I was there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are some series that I can't just read the book. I need the audio because the the narrator has infused so much into that audio world that it's like, I don't want to just read the book and leave it to my brain to figure it out. I want to hear them do it. I agree. And I think also there's the other side of it, too, where, I mean, there are people I know who just like would pick up one of my audiobooks and hate it and leave it. And I know that experience because I I listen to a lot of audiobooks and sometimes like I, I listen to the samples that they put up on Audible. Like some people, I think, why did they choose that narrator? You know, mm -hmm. because this is not the right narrator for this piece. There's a lot of books that I would love to narrate, but I also know that narration is based on what you sound like. I don't sound like Edward Herman, who does like historical books, and he's so brilliant at doing them. 
The one good thing that I have is that I can do a lot of different voices, but you know, most audiobooks they don't want you to do a lot of characters. They just want you to just have an inflection so that you know that somebody else is reading it. I'm I'm reading a, I don't know what his name, but I'm listening to this book right now called Angle of Repose. It's written by Wallace Stegner. And at first when I was listening to it, I thought, I don't know if I can listen to this guy for 22 hours. And I was thinking about like sending it back. And and I thought, well, you know, just give it a little more time. And now I can't imagine anybody else doing this book but this guy. I Mm -hmm. mean, he's just he's that good. So sometimes you have to like, you know, give it a chance. Give the person a chance to find their footing because always the beginning of the book is always a little bit not quite what it's going to be. What's your preparation process like for these books and, you know, dealing with characters and sometimes, honestly, challenging names? Well, first of all, I, there are basic things that I do with every book, and that is that I, I obviously read the book, and as I'm reading it, I color code the book. So each character has its own color, and then I highlight not narration, just actual dialogue. I'll I'll highlight like Wyborn was always a pale yellow color. And so whenever he spoke, his dialogue would come up in pale yellow. In the the last number of books, Jordan would label the the chapter by the character who was, you know, narrating. Mm-hmm. that particular part of the story. So I would keep that. I would always highlight the top. So I knew like who the character is that I'm reading in that chapter to keep track of it. And sometimes I would, you know, have to go back over stuff when I was narrating because Wyborn and Griffin are different, but sometimes they would end up like, wait a minute, that's, that sounds like Wyborn and that's supposed to be Griffin. So I'd have to go back and fix it. But so I I color code everything and then I have charts like that as I'm reading, I have one that has all the characters with their color codes so that then when I look at the book as I'm reading along, I can look and see, oh, yeah, that's that character. First of all, if they're characters that have recurred over and over again, we keep clips of the voice so that then I can listen to like a 30, 15, 30 seconds of the voice to remember what the voice was that I gave them before. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they don't show up for like two or three books. So right. <laughs> it was really helpful, you know. And if it's new characters, like I have to say the one character that I just really, really did a horrible job on <laughs> was, was some in the beginning was somebody who was Irish. I'm trying to remember. And Irish is not one of my accents. <laughs> I just can't. I mean, I could do British and German and French and all that, but. Irish and Scottish are really, they're so distinctive. And, you know, if you can't do them well, you shouldn't do them at all. You know, they're, they're really just that, that tough. I'm trying to remember who Hattie, for example, who's Cockney, you know, I had to just like, I, I, I've done Cockney before, but not Cockney women. So I would have to like, in addition to the reading, I would then do research to find out like, what did these people sound like? And what did they sound like then? Mm -hmm. I'd keep a list of words that I either didn't recognize, you know, because a lot of them were just old English words that we don't use anymore. So, and sometimes they have different pronunciations. So like the way we would pronounce a certain word here, they would pronounce it in England differently. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge, but it's like, it's a fun challenge, you know, all, all work should be that much fun to do as a challenge. You know, it's all about good writing. If the writing sucks, it's really hard to, to give it what it needs because, well, for me at least, cause you know, I'm fairly intelligent. So if I see something that is like poorly written, I, I keep getting drawn into the error of it as opposed to the creation of it, which means I shouldn't do those books, you know? You've got an extensive performance resume. I, I don't know if people who, who see your name on these audiobooks realize that you've got a huge career in TV and film and stage and all this other stuff. What what got you hooked into like going into the performance profession? I got accepted to this program called the British American Drama Academy, which was at Oxford. And I went to study Shakespeare over there. And it was the most amazing experience I have ever had in my life. 
and and my partner was wonderful because he just said go you know do this which is what i did but so then when i found things like audio i didn't have like i hated doing stage <laughs> I hated it because the people were right there. And I was like, I don't want to see you. You know, <laughs> so then it was like TV and film because then there's just the crew and all that stuff. But, you know, I was also going against the, the tide then because I, I was obviously gay and there was no place for gay people in TV and film when, when I was really trying to make a go of, at it. You know, there were no roles for, for people like me. And now there are more, not nearly enough, but I'm older. So all the people who are getting the work are these, you know, young people. And so I kind of like was in the wrong place at the wrong time through a lot of that stuff. But, you know, it made me who I am and it opened up other doors like voiceover and audiobooks. And I've been writing my whole life. So, you know, before I, w I went into acting, I was in public relations for like almost 20 years. And you hinted as you were talking about that, that you've also got this other kind of side of you that is the writer, that is producer director, not under Julian Simmons. Tell folks a little bit about that too, because you've got some stories and poems that can go read and a documentary that right. we all probably saw about 20 years ago. Right. Well, I co-produced a documentary called To Support and Defend, which was about lesbians and gays in the military. And it was when we were trying to make it legal for gay people to serve openly in the military. So we got uh, Sybil Shepard, who I knew through my work with Moonlighting, to host the documentary. And it was part of the big march on Washington in 93. And it was on the main stage there, which Sybil introduced it. And it was on PBS and we, sent our people to the Pentagon to deliver it and they got arrested. These are military people who were actually in the documentary. So we, we got a, a lot of press on that documentary. And then, you know, we, we did other things. We recently shot a pilot, which takes place in Provincetown and it's about the murders of gay men there, which we have been trying to sell. But, you know, as much as TV says they want things about gay people, they they don't. At the same time, they'll mm -hmm. find any reason not to do it, you know, because they're afraid that they won't get a big enough market share. I don't know. It's kind of strange. But I've also been writing. I've written a lot of journalistically. I've written maybe 60 articles and I've written a lot of historical pieces. And then I've done writing as a gay author. I wrote something called 130 AD, which was part of Lust in Time. It was about the Roman Emperor Hadrian and his last days with Antinous, who was his, his lover. Then I wrote a story more recently, which is available on Amazon, and it, it's called Math Equals Silence. And it's about a young boy, teenage boy, who hasn't come out yet. And they have an assignment to do something about how Leonardo da Vinci relates to mathematics. And so he discovers when he's doing the research that Leonardo da Vinci was gay. So he uses that as a way to come out to his class. And it's a, it's kind of an interesting story. I've never written a y young adult story before, so that was kind of cool. And I also l love writing poetry. I have a, a poem called Kenny Bunkport that's coming out as part of an anthology from Foglifter Press this coming fall, 2020. And I have another poem that was about my first relationship, which was with a British black man when I was 18. And that's called That Black, White, Gay, DL Love. And that was published by the Hawaii Review. As I get older, I'm like, really getting more and more interested in just writing mm -hmm. and perfecting my writing and, and just seeing if I can go somewhere with that. Because, I mean, I can do audiobooks in my pajamas, obviously, and I can be 90. As long as I have a brain that's working, I can keep doing them, right? But with acting, you know, TV and film, I, I have noticed just like in the last five years, the opportunities for actors who are older, and I'm lucky I don't look as old as I am. There's just like not that many opportunities anymore. 
Well, we'll definitely link up to those to those writing pieces that you've got. And if the documentary is out there to link up to that, we'll, we'll do that too so people can kind of see this other side. Do we get to hear you do more gay fiction, gay romances? Because right now, the only things that sit on Audible for you, under Julian Simmons anyway, are Wyborn and Griffin. Well, there is one other book, which I did under <laughs> the name Ian Dunay which Dune is a family name. It also means uh, Danube, like the river. So I did that name because it's kind of a raunchy gay book. It's called Valley of the Dudes. <laughs> and it's based like on the Valley of the Dolls, but from a gay perspective. So everyone's gay popping pills and, you know, having relationships that don't work. I would, lo I would do more gay books. I, I would like there to be substance to them, you know, like, Jordan's books have tremendous substance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do anything that's tawdry or shallow. You know, I want something that really is going to take humanity forward somehow or another, you know, and make gay people feel good about who they are. I would like to do more of those. I'm putting it out there if sure. anybody wants it. But, you know, I've been approached a couple of times and it hasn't it just hasn't worked out. Mm -hmm. And I think also there's a weird thing like when you're doing when you get to be known for one character so much that I think people are afraid to have you start doing their characters because you're so known for doing that. Right. You know, it's almost like competition. But now Wyburn and Griffin is done, which is very sad for me, not just not just, you know, professionally, but because I love these characters so much. They're mm -hmm. just like, so they're wonderful people. It's like you would want to know these people, you know, you'd want them to be your friends. How could people keep up with you online to know what's next and what you're up to? Well, I'm on Twitter at, at Julian G. Simmons, and I'm on Facebook. Julian G. Simmons, the same thing. And I, I try and, you know, be a good person and post things, but I don't nearly as much as I should. <laughs> I've always been good at like promoting everyone else, but not myself. So I, I'll, I'll try and do a better job of that. But I love to hear from people. I've heard from like, for example, there's a, a young woman, she's African American, lives in New York. And she got in touch with me. And she's interested in narrating. So I have over the last year, I've kind of been giving her my advice, I listen to what she, she records something. And then I say, well, try this and try that and everything. And it's just really wonderful to 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 be able to help somebody that way, you know, who really cares about what what they're about creating a career for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and they're young and all that. And it's like I remember what it was like. And a lot of times, you know, I'm sure even you like when you're there are times in your career when you think, I wish I had somebody who could tell me, you know, what I should be doing. And, and instead of making all the mistakes along the way that you maybe wouldn't have made if somebody told you, it's nice to have people who can mentor you and, and mm -hmm. give you advice. Yeah, for sure. It's great that you're kind of giving back that way to perhaps the young narrators who are out there right. to get a start. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and there's always room for more. Well, Julian, it has been incredible talking to you. I've enjoyed this so, so much. Thank you. Yeah, I've thank you for being myself. here. It's been great. Thank you very much. This week's interview transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks again to Julian for coming on and telling us all about his involvement in the Wyborn and Griffin series. If you want a little Wyborn and Griffin history... You can go back to episode 68 when Jordan joined us and talked about that series' origin story. All right, everyone. I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Coming up next week in episode 238, K.M. Newhold is going to join us, and we'll be talking about her upcoming release, Nailed, which is the second book in the Four Bears construction series. I so much enjoyed talking to K.M. I love... Uh, her Love Logic series, You Love Four Bears Construction. It's a wonderful interview and can't wait to get that to you guys. Yeah, you're definitely not going to want to miss that. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter if you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. 
Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.